Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Casey Murphy, and I'm ACTS Director of Programs and Events. I want to thank you for joining us today for ACTS July webinar entitled Contact Tracing, Driving Participation, Scale, and Innovation from a Mobility Framework, sponsored today by Hitch Rewards. Before we hear from our presenters this afternoon, I wanted to quickly take care of a few housekeeping items. First, all attendees are on mute during this webinar. If you have a question or have a problem hearing us, please type it in the chat box located in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to answer your questions as the webinar gets going. Second, we will be hosting a Q&A at the end of the webinar, but please feel free to type in your questions as we go in the Q&A box located in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Note, when typing in a question, please identify who the question is for when typing it in. Finally, this session is being recorded and we'll have the recording up on the ACT website within 24 hours after the presentation ends. Now I'd like to go ahead and introduce David Strauss, ACT's Executive Director, to give an update on what ACT currently has going on. David? Thank you, Casey. Good afternoon. We have a packed agenda today, so I'll try and keep my remarks brief. We have close to 300 registrants. I know that we have many non-members on today's call. So let me say welcome to you and provide you with a quick overview of ACT, the Association for Commuter Transportation. As the premier association for transportation demand management professionals, our goal is to build a strong community of individuals and organizations working to advance and implement TDM at their work sites and within their communities. ACT is your organization for the latest information and best practices on TDM. During these challenging and unprecedented times, it's been wonderful to see our members coming together online and via email to talk through ideas, share insights, and help each other. If you're not yet a member, I invite you to join our, your colleagues and become a part of our community. ACT membership is highly valued and very rewarding. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to update everyone on some exciting news from ACT. First, ACT continues to see success in our federal advocacy efforts to raise the role of TDM within federal transportation policy. In June, we saw the introduction of the Invest in America Act. For the first time, TDM strategies appears in several places throughout this important piece of legislation, providing access to billions of dollars of funding for TDM programs and initiatives. And through the manager's amendment, we were able to also include a definition of TDM and TDM strategies. And just last week, we saw the inclusion of TDM as a recommended strategy within the Transportation, Housing, Urban Development Appropriations Bill, which echoed the recommendation within the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis's June report stating the important role of TDM and what it can play in creating an efficient and sustainable transportation system. And, uh, and that TDM should be supported by Congress. Second, in two weeks, more than 400 of your colleagues and friends will gather for ACT's virtual international conference. The event will pro provide access to a trove of on-demand educational sessions, fabulous live keynotes and panel sessions, live networking and exhibit hall, and our national awards ceremony. Be sure to register and join us at actweb.org. Content will be available for three months. So even if you can't attend all of it live, you can access it anytime you want, as long as you register. Now, on to our main event and a whole new topic for ACT, addressing the role of mobility and contact tracing during the COVID era. As our country begins to reopen work sites, there's an opportunity for transportation platforms to play a role in assisting with safety and data gathering and it's important for TDM professionals to understand the potential power of the technology and opportunities to incorporate mobility as the framework to help communities reopen their economies. Our webinar sponsor today is Hitch, whose mission is to help employers motivate and measure a safer, greener, smarter commute. As well, we're excited to bring you a sneak peek at content from the recently completed USDOT study titled Analysis of Travel Choices and Scenarios for Sharing Rides, highlighting data from the Nashville study conducted by Hitch. So let's get right to it as I introduce Dr. Trish Holliday, former Assistant Commissioner for Human Resources and the first Chief Learning Officer for the state of Tennessee, who will set the stage for us. Trish. 
Thank you so much, David. I'm so glad everybody's here today. Let's take a look at the agenda. And as you're looking at the agenda slide, you'll see all of these important questions that we're gonna to answer today. Now, as you read these questions, just know the journey we're gonna take you on, it's gonna be a counterintuitive journey, which would suggest that it is not typically what you expect. So as we answer these questions for you, one of the things that I'm excited that we're gonna to get to do together is explore this whole idea of what we mean with contact tracing and with hitch rewards. And as, you, as Governor O'Malley stated in his book, Smarter Government, he says it's really important for us to lead with real-time awareness. Well, today, we're gonna to make sure that we raise awareness for you in the following categories. We wanna talk about how big data can save lives. We wanna show that data-driven decisions are differentiators to success. We wanna make sure and highlight how to deploy incentives so that you can actually change behavior in your organizations. We want to focus on the TDM strategies that are uh, increasing mobility in those disadvantaged communities. We want to look at, at specifically the value of culture and how if we want to create a go-to workplace where employee anxieties are minimized and reduced and where we actually care for employee needs, and we've got to talk about culture in the midst of this conversation. And we want to make it where it's safe to return to work. So hold on to your seats, get ready for a great journey. And I'm excited to introduce to you Mark Cleveland, who's a visionary, he's an entrepreneur who knows how to get things done. His commitment to excellence has brought him and the Hitch team to accomplish things at a very grand scale, something amazing, unprecedented um, with private funding. And today we wanna to make sure that we have the opportunity to share those lessons with you that are benefiting society and the greater good. He is today's sponsor and the CEO of Hitch Rewards, Mark. Hey, thank you, Trish. I appreciate it. I want to, first of all, say thanks to ACT for including us in this grand vision for how we can make mobility tracking systems a central defense strategy for COVID. And I want to, I want to recognize that we're facing a pretty tall order today, how to get things moving safely again. Uh, so let's all move to what we know for sure. This is a, a recent slide from McKinsey and Company. And it's uh, talking a little bit about the way that uh, shared mobility has become uh, challenged with in the context of COVID-19. And I want to also move on to the next slide quickly where we just recognize that employers are spending a great deal of time and energy getting their employee sites ready. We have spent a bunch of time sheltering in place we now know as a community that that's the safe place to be. And now we're trying to get to a safe work site. But the missing link between safe work sites and safe home sites is how do we get there? How do we track intelligently and smartly our mobility decisions? And we all know that this new anxiety, next slide, will show us that uh, we have a COVID related recession. We have. Uh, something to focus on, which is the ability to mitigate the curve. And we know we need to allay fears, but these are the same things that we're trying to do with the environmental impacts that we know that we face with emissions and transportation congestion. We know we have to achieve broad community support across the board, and we have to prepare ultimately for multiple waves or a return to traffic as we hated it. And in order to accomplish all that, you should have a TDM platform in place. And we all believe, and many of us have something in place that accomplishes uh, that goal. And we're adding to that the perspective of an integrated health tracking system. And we'd like to make sure people know that a carbon zero commute is available for anyone in America, free. And this is uh, a time for us to cement our hard earned uh, 
uh, victories in the TDM space and our habits that need to be cemented in terms of telecommuting and uh, attitudes towards safety. At Hitch, we believe that getting moving again is something that has to be done that's healthy and green. So COVID uh, basically gives us an opportunity to reframe this. And in the next slide, uh, we're asking the question, are people willing to share their data for a safer community? So Hitch is, of course, a California privacy compliant app, and we are pushing that same aggressive privacy standard across the United States. And we also, and in the next slide, are gonna just directly address a couple of things that are everybody's questions. Um, and uh, pardon me, so the next slide talks here about uh, what, what privacy means, a little bit about participation, how do we get a triple bottom line victory for public policy. And <clears throat> so I'll, I'll address this next question on the next slide. What do you gotta do about it? We're gonna show you briefly how our commuter wellness pledge functions. We've already implemented shelter in place. We're already working with helping employers manage quarantines and reinforcing physical distancing reminders. We wanna capture and contribute mobility data to facilitate professional contact tracing. In the next slide, we just briefly hit one, two, three, four. This is the uh, user definable, customer state definable wellness pledge that gets everybody uh, thinking about their health and their readiness to commute at the beginning of their commute rather than when they arrive at the work site. In the next slide, we basically suggest a simple system is what uh, works for the majority of people. And I want to focus on the fourth element, which is our uh, consumer metrics presentation. Uh, as you see, we, we measure time and transit and mode and things like that. But that example there helps you understand how we're going to move into the next uh, world where we're reminding people about the physical distancing that they need to uh, keep in mind. This is a learned behavior, by the way, our physical distancing behaviors in mobility. Um, here is, is an example. Hitch has been doing location and proximity tracking for four years. Uh, this isn't a new activity for us. Here might be a score of 100%. The next slide is a suggestion of an overlap and we'll be managing the physical distancing score. And we'll just simply remind people when they're inside those safe circles and how long they stay there and basically give them a feedback loop. And the next slide suggests how that might be used in mass transit to just expedite the reminder process. And it will work with people who are broadcasting on BLE and our system is sniffing for that. And it's just a, an opportunity for us to say, hey, one of the behaviors we wanna reinforce is physical distancing and here's a reminder to maintain your space. The counterintuitive part of what we wanna suggest here is that our data shows that single occupancy vehicles are currently the preference, they're historically the enemy and going future, they may be the way, they're the Trojan horse for us to get in and train people on how to share and how to return to mass transit. This is a quick example of a project for LAX. You know, imagine that that's the impacted region around LAX. And as we move through this slide, you'll see uh, there's a ride that originates in an equity community, somewhere that there is a, uh, a, a geographic or an earning opportunity, a socioeconomic region we can identify where a ride originates. And then it runs through a corridor and it pops out and We'll, we'll share throughout the end of this presentation and towards the end of it, how to, how to get more information. But you can see as we walk through these examples, this is an example of our rules driven engine in the sky that participants can uh, run through. And on the next slide, we just expedite that process with a, uh, an example of shared rides starting in uh, major employer zones or equity zones, running through impacted corridors, running at speed through congestion uh, and through construction sites and ending at maybe a high impact location employer site. On the right hand side, we just simply distribute pennies and we wind up having some great results. So um, as I get to uh, my transition, I'm really, really, really thrilled to uh, share some insights from our 12 million miles. I wanna say one of my favorite books is The Marketing Secrets of a Grateful Dad. 
And on chapter one, it talks about new business models being as important as business product or, or the product model. And then chapter six outlines how to embrace technology and how on chapter 13 to free your content, which is what we're doing. And the summary here is that our program, uh, this contact tracing universe, as we click through this, David, is basically to work with partners to define desired commute behavior, develop those commute behaviors and conditions in the sky that I demonstrated briefly, create incentives that drive the behavior, create evangelists, and also acquire the ownership of the data for the sponsoring organization. And through that, we can help with, uh, on the mobility framework, we can help with participation, scale, and innovation, and feed that right straight back to uh, the metro part partner regions. So I mentioned that Marketing Secrets of the Grateful Dead is one of my favorite books. And as I enter the next slide, I just want to acknowledge Governor Martin O'Malley is uh, being introduced at this moment. I'm holding up his book, Smarter Government and How to Govern for Results in the Information Age. He is a Celtic singer and a songwriter and author of this recently re released book and a good friend of Smarter Government. I'd like to turn it over to Governor Martin O'Malley. Sorry, Governor, you're on mute. Unmute. There you go. Joel Sorry. Said. That's okay. He said technically proficient. Uh, I guess that's one reason why my band never opened up for the Grateful Dead. Huh? <laughs> Mark, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to uh, I want to just share with you uh, a couple of insights, and I share these these insights as a person who was a former mayor of Baltimore, former governor of Maryland, at a particular hinge in human history, where uh, we have now have in our hands technologies that no other self-governing people have ever had before. So I want to talk about that insight, but I also want to talk, especially in relation to Hitch and and the debate around contact tracing that we're only now starting to have as a people. Uh, one of the most important questions that, that leaders in the public sector have to ask of those who, uh, through their own imagination and creativity, show up at the, their doorstep with a new innovation. So let me talk about the first uh, insight, and it is this. Uh, ubiquitous technologies that all our millennial children take for granted, namely geographic information systems and the Internet of Things, have now given us the ability to model, to measure, and to map dynamic, changing systems in ways we've never had the ability to do before. And transportation and the transportation sector has been at the cutting edge of this. Uh, uh, many of us can't imagine going from point A to B without uh, putting in the, the two coordinates and having a, a pleasant sounding voice tell us that a, a quicker route is available now. Uh, that ability is something, is a big first for democracy. It is a movement away from command and control to collaboration. It is about elevating the power of the one individual. And it is about creating uh, with openness and transparency, a common platform of nudges and rewards. In other words, there's nothing about what Hitch does that tells people they must elect to behave in this better way for society. But there is something really ingenious about the ability of Hitch to be able to provide nudges, provide rewards, set rules that advance the common good. Most often we think about it in terms of climate change, but also uh, increasingly in this era of COVID, you hear that new language developing uh, of the truth that we're all in this together, that each of us needs to make better decisions if all of us are going to get better. So let me bring you to the second, um, the second uh, insight I wanted to share with you, and it is this. Uh, I was the first governor in our state to have a chief innovation officer. And for all of the cool innovations that people came forward with, uh, the toughest question that each of them was asked was, where have you done this before 
that it actually worked? And what can you tell me about it? What did you learn from it? Uh, a lot, because innovation in the public sector, uh, uh, if you fail, it's often punished by uh, uh, voting people out of office. Uh, so what we're going to be able to share with you and uh, what Charlie Apigian will share with you in a second. He's the, uh, uh, was named chief, I mean, the best data scientist of the year in his home place in, in Nashville, is uh, what we have learned from Nashville and the fact that this has already worked someplace before. And make no mistake about it, that, that same basic technology, the ability to model, measure, and map systems with GIS and the Internet of Things, in this case, our cell phones, uh, it is uh, it's the, same, the same platform that will allow us to do contact tracing at a scale and speed is also the same platform that Hitch has been using, practicing, learning from. And Charlie's going to now, I'm going to turn it over to Charlie to share with you some of the key findings. You know, if we only knew what we already knew. Well, Charlie's going to be able to share with you what we now know about what the reward has to be, what the point of, uh, of diminishing returns is in terms of uh, size of the award, and in order to get people to participate at scale with a new innovation that serves our common good. So Charlie, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, uh, Governor O'Malley. And first of all, uh, thank you for your wonderful words and for the introduction. I think it's very fitting that you spell it out as model measure and map and looking for rewards for the common good. So uh, I'm just gonna uh, share with you some snippets and basically two different objectives that we had this year. And before I get started with that, on the next slide you see uh, at the at MTSU, Middle Tennessee State University's Data Science Institute, which is uh, I'm the director of, have been for a few years now, we have been with Hitch from day one. And so what you see on your screen there is couple of students that worked with Hitch from the uh, beginning. And so Hitch opened in January of 2018. And by the spring of uh, 2018, we were already analyzing their data. And I had a team of five students looking for what the data was telling us on what creates a sustained user. And so it was early on in the data. We worked on that for about nine months. And then uh, after that, we, um, reconvened this year in the next slide um, to to focus on two main um, uh, analyses and the first was really to validate the database structure of Hitch to see if it can go from being a ride sharing platform to more of a mobility platform that can extend into other areas such as contact tracing. And so um, I was taking a deep dive into looking at the structure and you see on the screen there, you see all those nice little boxes with the blue headings. That's, that's the database and we blurred it out, you know, for the competitors out there. But um, getting into that, we saw a robust system that was very flexible and more important could scale and, um, and be able to look at other things as we get going. The other uh, component that we looked at is we were working with um, the U.S. Department of Transportation, and uh, through that, and by the way, uh, Dave, you can go back one just real quick. Um, and uh, as part of our uh, deep dive, we were contacted by the U.S. Department of Transportation for a report they were doing, and we wanted to give them some nice little nuggets from what we were seeing, and we're going to share a couple of those here today. Um, but you can see the rest of that in Alan Greenberg's report, uh, Analysis of Travel Choices Scenarios, for sharing rides that should be coming out uh, here in the near future. Okay, next slide. So before we get into the data, let's take a look at a simplified version of the database. And so you see users are at the center of this. And uh, if you go uh, to the right, you see trips, partners. And so everything is based on the trip. And since this was set up initially, uh, it started off just as ride sharing. But in September of 2019, uh, solo rides were also added and it worked. And so trips can, if it meets certain rules, will lead to certain rewards and partners can be sponsors of certain rules. 
and they could be geofenced, it could be pennies per mile, it could be a, a multiple uh, types of rewards. But the idea, again, is to incentivize people for their mobility um, uh, choices. And, and so in looking at that, um, they also added in April of this year, shelter in place, which means if I'm in my house as a, an employee and I'm doing remote work, I can shelter in place so that we know that I am staying home, still working, and I can be incentivized for that. And so um, in the end, I was incredibly um, uh, appreciative of how they set up their database and to really see it that it truly could be scalable. So the next slide, the next slide really get, gets into the data dive. And what we are calling it is just hitch phase one. And so we had a lot of use cases within um, the uh, data. And one of the uh, big ones was the Nashville market. And the Nashville market um, basically started in January of 2018 with Nissan as a market sponsor who was paying five cents a mile. Um, for anybody that was in the Nashville market for ride sharing, had to be obviously a, a, a ride share. And from that, uh, we, had, we were able to get a lot of really interesting data. For example, what is a sustained user and what do they look like? How many uh, rides do they have? What's the pennies per mile? Um, what is the relationship between no reward and continuing to use the app or the last trip? And then of course, what everybody's asking, I see it's already a question, is how much does it cost? What does it take to incentivize somebody to continue to ride share and, and use the app? And so that's really what we're looking at. And so how does this tie into our, our topic today is we're looking at ride sharing as a mechanism, but it's really a mobility, mobility uh, platform that if we can incentivize people to use it, we can also um, incentivize them to keep that track to um, ensure that they're not sick when they do go out of the house and then also to be incentivized for ride sharing when things get back to normal or solo rides until they can ride share um, in the meantime. And so we felt really good about that. So let, let's dive into a little bit of the data. And what I'm really going to focus on is two things. The first is, do incentives um, really lead to ride sharing? And so the miles compared to incentives. And the second is, if it does, how much? And so we have over 12 million miles. We had 18,000 people download the app and create an account. 15,000 of those uh, accounts had real miles, so they completed a trip. And 10,889, yes, I know the real number. Uh, I've looked at it a thousand times. Mark knows this about me, um, had multiple uh, rides over multiple months. And so those are the people that we really focused on. So in looking at what you see on your screen there, you see that on the uh, left side is when it started pretty much February. It, it opened in, in January, but really miles started in February. And about five cents per mile was the incentive for people. And you see that it steadily uh, rose in total miles per month. So that's everybody combined looking at those in total miles. And over time, we were dropping it down to see what could be the floor. And so again, this was meant to be an experiment. Nissan was nice enough to help start this for us, but we wanted to see if people would continue to ride share as we dropped the incentive. And so trying to find that floor as well as a ceiling was really our objective here. Um, and, and also seeing the flexibility of the system within that. And so one thing that's interesting is if you look at June of 2019, that's pretty much when the incentives stopped. And you see how it drops below two cents a mile. And then look what happens to those blue bars. And the blue bars are the miles per month and how drastically they come down at that point. And that has a lot to do with the fact that they weren't getting the amount. And we saw that two cents a mile became a big deal. I'm gonna keep coming back to that number here um, as we get going. So let's talk about the money here uh, for a second. What does it take? And on this screen, what I wanted to know is if we were to incentivize, we have to think about what does it take to, to, to incentivize one of our employees or residents or, or um, colleagues? And if you started with two cents a mile, if you started at a penny per mile, what about five cents a mile? What does that do? And you see I've got on there two cents a mile. 
uh, over three months are they still a user? And so you see the 48.5 for three or more. That means if you were to have two cents a mile, 48% of the users were still using the app. 33% in month six. So six or more, six or more months still using the app. At five cents, it's 50% uh, were still using the app in the sixth month. And so we were really looking at sustained use there. And so we started seeing that the band was two cents to five cents. So let's go to the next slide. And looking at the total miles, what we see is that there's a diminishing return. Once you get to five cents, that's about the max that we saw with this experiment. Now, you know, again, this was the Nashville experiment here. Um, other cities may be different, but once we got to, to five cents, it looks like you see a steady rise from two cents to five, but not much of a difference. And then once you get there, it, it drops off. And a lot of that has to do with if you've got more than uh, five cents, it probably dropped off after that, and that was an issue. So finally, let me just uh, conclude here and, and pass it off to my next colleague. What we found is that the low was two cents per mile. What does that mean? That means $3.54 per month if they average 177 miles per month, which is the average within the, the system. As high as five cents a mile, and that would be $8, $8.85 per month. So if you were a, a company and you want to incentivize your employees or a, a municipality, $5,000 per month could incentivize 1,500 users at two cents a mile. And so that's what, uh, uh, just a few nuggets of what we saw. If you want to see more about this, and you want to see a predictive model, uh, I, um, I will be presenting this at the Nashville Technology Council's uh, Data Analytics Summit on September 21st and 22nd. Um, and I'll have a whole hour to look at the data. Um, and you'll find that link here at the end. But now it is my pleasure to uh, pass it off to somebody that's taking it from phase one to phase two. And that is Sean Falzer, the transportation planning manager of the Greater Regional Nashville Council. And uh, he's willing to jump on the journey with us at this point and see what we can do in the future together. And so Sean, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Charlie, I appreciate it. Um, Subbing in today for our executive director, uh, Michael Skipper, who's the, um, our, our director at the uh, Greater Nashville Regional Council, but hopefully I can convey some of the um, opportunities and benefits that we see in phase two of uh, expanding Hitch throughout the, the Nashville market. Um, just a quick background, Greater da Nashville Regional Council, we're the Regional Council, Council for Middle Tennessee. Um, we carry out the transportation planning activities, and this is a fairly recent um, change uh, since the integration of the Nashville area MPO into uh, the GNRC in 2017. And part of that reason was uh, had kind of 10 shared goals in that integration process, uh, but one of them was to help streamline and improve regional coordination. Um, it's been one of the themes that's carried forward into the update of our regional transportation plan that we kicked off this past fall. <clears throat> the focus of that was really on um, having a unified plan for the region that built on some of these shared goals and objectives um, and also identified um, some of the responsibilities that were, um, that, that entities within the region are, are responsible for. So <clears throat> what can local governments, uh, the private sector, as well as the Department of Transportation um, and transit agencies contribute um, COVID has had a, an impact on that plan, um, but we're still thinking um, more broadly this time around. And so um, as part of this update, we're, we're seeking kind of more uh, non-traditional opportunities to um, achieve the, the goals and objectives. Um, we're tr um, getting outside of the traditional strategy of just the um, infrastructure investments and improvements and trying to consider also those incentives and rewards um, any studies, research, and data analysis that can help us achieve those goals, as well as um, on the education and, and promoting uh, programming side of things as well. And so um, I'll talk a little bit about how phase two, I think, will help us achieve that. Um, you know, expanding the Hitch platform across the region not only aligns <clears throat> with those objectives that we've established, but um, we think that it um, has the ability to kind of carry us forward and um, address some of those common good or uh, common goals of the region um, that we've, we've uh, established. And so 
Um, phase two, um, talk just a little bit about how that was funded. And so the MPO carved out a transit and technology program through its uh, current uh, regional transportation plan with the goal of um, to accelerate the deployment of emerging technologies as well as transit options uh, to contribute to improving uh, mobility in the region. And the process I went through for that was a, um, a first round solicitation for the program in 2019 uh, that had a, a fairly predominant TDM focus to it um, on promoting and implementing non-SOV travel. Um, Hitch was one of the award recipients uh, within that first round solicitation, uh, an approximately $2 million award uh, utilizing STBG service tra transportation block grant funds. Um, and I will point out that that is uh, carved out through the MPO's discretionary funding. Um, typical breakdown of 80-20, 80% federal funding, 20% uh, local sponsor match. And then, um, as I mentioned, with the scope of, of really expanding that um, hitch platform across our uh, metropolitan planning area. And so some of the benefits that we have uh, identified and that you see listed on this slide, um, one is, is moving from um, kind of anonymous data and periodic surveys to real-time direct um, commuter relationships. And so traditionally, we've relied on uh, household travel surveys and attitudinal surveys that we will update every four or five years or so to assess changes in the travel preferences over time. Um, these efforts can be pretty expensive and require a significant share of our uh, local planning or tra transportation planning dollars to go towards that efforts. And so we see that um, this is an opportunity that you know, compiling that data every four or five years is, is not necessarily well suited to sudden changes like we've seen in um, travel demand uh, on this transportation system and, and changing preferences for, for transportation modes. And so um, we're very interested in the opportunity to, uh, and, and now I think even more so for, for real time monitoring ongoing feedback uh, to gather information from our commuters in the region. Another is to, um, to own the data con to contribute to a lot of our GNRC modeling and planning efforts. And so MPOs um, around the country are pretty well suited to synthesize a lot of the data that comes in, um, not only across geographies, but across modes. And we're continually seeking data to augment those existing, more traditional data sources that we use um, in order to not only monitor uh, the system, but also use those inputs into our models to predict future uh, travel patterns. Another is um, GNRC data and, and our understanding of short-term and long-term infrastructure investments. And so another responsibility that we have as, as MPOs is to understand the effectiveness of our investment decisions. And so um, better understanding to what degree we're making progress towards uh, the region's goals and, and, and objectives and you know, whether certain investments are having an impact on uh, improving mobility or reducing congestion in the region. And so uh, we believe that the HITCH data can support and enhance that ongoing evaluation of, of transportation investments. And probably the most interesting aspect um, that I'll mention is the ability to design the rules um, and, and kind of shape those incentives. Um, and I think this goes back to, you know, they can be unique to each particular region, um, given the, the region specific goals or policy objectives. And so a couple that we've identified um, just based on our um, policy framework as part of this regional transportation plan is um, potential to use incentives to increase carpooling or transit use um, to improve mobility options for traditionally underserved communities by uh, potentially rewarding drivers for serving um, uh, populations, traditionally underserved communities, and also um, a greater incentives to, to decrease the travel demand during the peak uh, rush hour periods. A lot of our focus uh, in terms of modeling and projecting future forecasts re revolves around that commute period. And so thinking of potential ways to offer surge incentives, um, kind of think of it as an opposite of surge pricing um, that we're familiar with, with um, um, uh, Uber and Lyft and such. Um, another is uh, enhanced engagement with the area's travelers. And so through rewards for participating in surveys, um, we can get kind of more, more frequent feedback from the uh, 
uh, users of the system. And then um, as we look about look into freight, better movement of freight within and around the region, um, big focus in Nashville is trying to avoid um, freight haulers from utilizing the interstates downtown. And so uh, potential incentives to, for them to avoid um, uh, using the downtown interstates if it's a viable option. So um, with that, I'll just say that we're excited to embark on phase two um, in order to realize some of these benefits. Um, it is one of the more unconventional um, projects that we've funded through our grant uh, programs, but we're optimistic that of its potential and the incentives that, the ability of it for incentives to change behavior in the region. Um, so now I'll turn it over. Um, I'll hand it off to Aaron Steiner, another innovator whose program is connecting people to jobs and recognizing the critical importance of creating more mobility options and more cost-effective ways of getting people back to work. And so um, the Commuters Trust Program in South Bend has been a, a brave, creative plan uh, that I think we can all learn from. And he's going to take an opportunity today to share that vision. Um, he's the Director of the Innovation for the City of South Bend. Go ahead, Aaron. Thanks, Sean. Thanks so much for um, having me on today, everyone. Great to be with you. And I'm glad to share just a little bit briefly about what we're doing a couple of hundred miles north of Nashville in South Bend. Um, and I hope that it sparks um, an idea for those of you on the, on the phone or on the call today. Dave, we can go to the next slide. Um, in South Bend, we're just over 120,000 residents in the city proper. And one of the greatest mobility challenges that we face is connecting our residents to jobs and to job opportunity. And you know, that's a problem for um, workers, particularly low income shift workers in our region. And a study back um, a couple of years ago in 2016, one out of three low income workers in our regions um, reported that transportation was their top barrier to obtaining a job or keeping a job. Um, and it's not just a problem for them, it's, employer, it's a problem rather for employers in our region as well. We think it's a multi-million dollar problem when it comes to the cost of turnover. So especially in a pre-COVID environment where we had a pretty tight labor market, very low unemployment, and there was very much a war for talent, um, it costs employers to lose employees that can't get to work because they don't have the means to get there. Um, so in South Bend, we were fortunate in 2018 through the Bloomberg Philanthropies U.S. Mayor's Challenge to win a million dollar three-year grant to try to tackle this pro problem head on. Um, and what we did last year in 2019 is launched our Commuters Trust Program, which Sean alluded to. Um, and the idea is um, we're partnered with multiple local employers in our community, and we're offering transportation benefits to their workforce to help them with their commute to and from work. And it's a bundle of a number of mobility discounts. So we have a program with our local bus, regional bus system, um, as well as one of the TNC operators in our community, as well as um, incentives leveraging the Hitch Rewards Program. We launched our um, Hitch uh, partnership earlier this year in 2020, pre-COVID, and we're actually providing participants in our program up to 50 cents per mile. So I know you saw some data from Charlie about much lower numbers. In South Bend, we're approaching the problem a little bit differently and targeting a specific community, which we know is under-resourced, underserved. So we're upping the ante and we're, we're um, providing a, uh, rewards of up to 50 cents per mile. So that's what we have been doing and have had some early success since launching last year. We can go to the next slide, David. Um, and then of course, I wanna share about what's been happening with our program since COVID um, has impacted our community. And a couple of challenges that won't be unique, obviously to our community. I'm sure many of you on the phone, on the call um, are dealing with you know, variations of these same problems. The first of which is that the entirety of our program right now anyway, is based on shared mobility, shared transportation modes and options. So with COVID, obviously, um, we're kind of trying to tackle head on, how do we manage the health and safety risk that our participants and our residents might face because of um, the transmission of, of the um, virus in our community? Um, the second would be our program. The idea is, is that it's an, an employer sponsorship model. So we have our employer partners paying in. Um, and those same employer partners right now in this recessionary environment are facing a lot of fiscal pressure and aren't able to contribute in the ways they have in the past. And then lastly, um, the labor market has obviously totally flipped on its head, where previously I mentioned there was this war for talent, very tight um, labor market. We now have unemployment that spiked in our county, um, hit 20% um, um, about six weeks ago. So what have we been doing to try to react to this? 
Um, one of the things in terms of health and safety is Mark alluded to the Hitch Wellness Pledge, which we are on the cusp of rolling out here, hopefully in the next um, week or two. And that will be one way that we can provide some assurance that if we're um, facilitating a carpool between residents, between coworkers in our community, that they've gone through that pledge um, and that we also have access to some of the data that we could share if needed to do contract tracing related to the mobility part of you know, their um, you know, overall employment. Um, the second would be in terms of um, fiscal pressure. You know, we are kind of looking at our employer partnerships and trying to figure out, you know, there are cer certain surge industries right now. So looking at transportation logistics, looking at healthcare, some of those partnerships and, you know, trying to find where there's still need. The reality is that the employers that we're working with, um, you know, there are, um, these are essential workers. So, you know, it's important that these people are still able to get to work. These are, you know, a lot of workers that aren't able to work from home. Um, like many of us might be able to. And then lastly, we're looking at expanding the program to cover the unemployed. So we have a partnership that we're working on with our lo work, local workforce development board. So just a few of the ways that we're trying to adapt to the environment. And really it comes down to um, in South Bend, you know, we think that in the long term, our recovery from COVID is going to require and depend on more access and safer mobility options. Um, so we're, you know, actively, as I've kind of shared, working to address head on some of those challenges and our partnership with Hitch and the ability to track behavior and commuting and then also um, apply incentives to that is really a key part of what we think the recovery will be. So I know we're moving along. Um, so I'll pass it off back, back to um, Dr. Trish Holliday, who's going to share a little bit more, tie it all together about how culture and innovation really are key to, you know, adapting to the times that we're in. Back to you, Trish. Thanks so much, Aaron. And as we wrap this up and get to our question and answer time, I want to I want to give a perspective on culture that's so important for us all to consider, especially when in times of uncertainty, innovation is a, a say easy, do hard. And so think about this particular theory. I love this theory mainly because I enjoy saying it. Uh, it's functional fixedness. And in this theory, it says, and as David, as you move to the next slide, what happens in functional fixedness is organizations get trapped in thinking, this is the way we need to do it. This is how we've always done it. In chapter three of Smarter Government with uh, Governor O'Malley's uh, book, he gives examples of what you could find in organizational culture where you know that you're trapped in functional fixedness because you've got people saying this is the way we do it that's not the way we do it here and you begin to pick up all of these signs that you're trapped in functional fixedness well the way to get out of functional fixedness and i love carol dweck's work about the growth mindset because it really says okay if we're going to talk about the value of culture we have to create an environment where continuous improvement becomes a priority. It becomes part of who we are and we're not scared of it. We actually invite this idea of growth. Looking at the next slide, you'll see that it's really about empowering your employees from the inside. So I know when I introduced Mark Cleveland as the CEO of Hitch Rewards, I defined him as an amazing entrepreneur. Well, when we talk about in an entrepreneur, when we talk about inside an organization, we want our employees to feel like they themselves can be innovative. And so how do we do that? We give them the opportunity to be curious, to embrace uncertainty, to actually, let's not be punitive when people step out and try and experiment, but let's reward and acknowledge and recognize daring courage to try something new. Let's make sure that when we try something and it doesn't work, that resiliency is part of who we are as a culture. And then finally, another trait that you know your culture is someplace people want to be is when there's this contagious collaboration. People want to come be a part of something that's bigger than themselves. And when we talk about the value of culture, and I could spend a whole nother hour with you all really taking a deeper dive in understanding why culture is critical to this conversation. Because if we want to change behavior, 
We know we have to go to culture. We have to look at it. And we know that we can do all the plans and have all the strategy, but if we don't get the people engaged and we don't start to incentivize the participation of programs that help change behavior, we're not gonna get anywhere. We'll be trapped in functional fixedness. If we look at the last slide, the bottom line for us today is to make sure that we understand this idea and there's a whole theory around collective impact and and we could again study this more in depth and i would invite you and your organizations to take a look at it it's when you come together and you've got a really large scale complex problem but when you bring perspectives in, when you have diversity and inclusion as part of solving that problem, the collective impact framework is very, very powerful. And I believe this is part of how we could look at this whole hitch rewards, large scale behavior change in our organizations. I'm gonna turn it back over to Mark. Mark, sorry, you're muted. Thank you, Trish. I made the same mistake the governor made there. I'm not muted now. Uh, we'll just be brief. I think it's important to, uh, I, to, to, to encapsulate. We talked about how to get scale. We talked about how to get participation. I believe the mobility industry can come together. We're willing to integrate with anybody like Agile Mile and Commutify and all the competitors out there who uh, would like to bring sort of this connective tissue together. And we're excited to share the data through the USDOT, through MTSU, and I hope that uh, you will all uh, register for uh, the different events that are available for you to follow up on. There's a link in chat for that. Um, hope tonight you'll come to the ACT uh, event and that you'll collaborate. And if you wanna see our, our take on the third wave of public transportation, attention to what, uh, is going to be said for an hour there by Charlie coming up in September or set up an opportunity to talk to us. You can see there's a link here, hitch.me forward slash collaborate. And uh, I think it's also important to remind everyone that there are door prizes at the end of the Q&A. Uh, we have a system for that. So watch the chat to see if you're a winner and uh, I'll turn it over to Casey. Thank you very much, Mark, and thank you to all our panelists this afternoon. Uh, we have a few minutes here for uh, uh, possibly a couple questions. I'll start with one that uh, just came up for you, uh, Dr. Holliday. Uh, for mo mobility tracking uh, to become a more powerful tool supporting contact tracing, what works better, requiring participation or incentivized participation? Great question, and, and I think it's really important to note that forced participation is not how you create a go-to workplace. If you want an adaptive and innovative culture, you've got to help uh, create the things, put the things in place where people want to participate, want to participate. And this is that incentivizing uh, efforts that we've been talking about. And one of the things that to note with this, and, and I'll be brief, but culture change it can't be achieved through mandate. And if we want strong behavior change and we want people to feel empowered to be a part of something bigger than themselves, we have to create that environment that invites them in and recognize people who are doing it. It's a really big key. Thank you, Casey. Thank you. And this next one, I'll let any of our panelists jump in here. Uh, with all the data, how are you all handling data security? Well, it's usually a question that I get asked, so I'm not terribly surprised to, to hear it. This is Mark, and uh, we focused on this for the last almost five years now. I'll just say that we partnered with another fantastic technology company here in Nashville, a company called Certainty, and uh, I'll put the link uh, there in the chat for you to take a look at. We've, we do all the standard network technology, security, all the standard things. We've taken an extra step. We've actually encrypted the data itself. So the data is smart. It knows who should look at it, who should have access to it. Just like we have rules that drive behavior, we have rules that drive sharing when it comes to the data. Excellent. And now I think we have a question here from Bill in San Diego. Bill? If we're trying to drive participation in this program for mass transportation, why don't we just make public mass transportation free? Wow, there's a, bill, a, qu a question from Bill Walton. <laughs> um, that, 
I don't know. Maybe we should pose that question to the people who are the audience. Well, Sean and Charles, you're the analytics guys. Why don't you tell us what that would do to the ridership of our currently devastated public transportation systems if you just said, it's free, get on. Yeah, I think, uh, Bill, first of all, it's an honor to uh, be able to address a question from you. And looking at the data, we, we, we know that um, mass transit has been a good incentivized uh, uh, avenue for uh, ride sharing. And we have the data, the, the, the Hitch app does a great job of beaconing out for bus trips. And we're, we are seeing people get together, have 10 to 15 people hitched together on a regular basis and they created little communities. And, and so I think there is something to that. Um, I'd leave that up to the, the politicians. I'm just the data guy, but I think that's a wonderful question um, that, that should be addressed. Which countries, which communities, which cities, who are doing the best job around the world in terms of getting people to use public and mass transportation and hitch ride sharing programs? Well, so far, the question about the hitch ride sharing and the hitch tracking, the mobility and behavior tracking system, it's Nashville. It's the center of innovation in that area. But I guess we probably ought to pass it to David Strauss to ask who's doing the best getting mass transit participation. Uh, well, many other countries around the world are, are doing a more fabulous job than the United States than in getting uh, ridership onto public transit. Uh, but there are some great communities throughout the country that, that uh, are pushing it. We definitely are facing a challenge now more than ever in regards to the impacts of uh, the coronavirus on the use of public transit. And uh, you know, it's been interesting to see uh, how commuters are responding, the concerns they have with crowds. Uh, and it's going to take a real concerted effort from the federal level to really bolster up and support uh, systems around the country so that they can survive to continue to provide these important connections to individuals uh, to get to work. Uh, in the, in the near future. And what is the status of the next stimulus bill, which I believe is being debated as we're speaking right now? Wh where does public mass transportation and ride sharing come in on the next stimulus? It's a wonderful question. Uh, public transit systems are, of course, you know, received, uh, I believe, what was it, over $20 billion in the first stimulus package. Uh, in the next round, uh, there are... So did the fossil here. fuel companies and the renewable energy people got zero. Yeah. And that's a mistake. Yeah. Well, we definitely uh, have a long way to go in order to address uh, the needs of our communities around the country to provide the services. And, you know, one of the opportunities that is out there with for TDM professionals and the programs that we operate is... How do we continue to provide the access to the jobs, whether it's through telecommuting, carpooling, van pooling, um, you know, helping people get onto their bikes, walking to work and providing them the education and resources uh, to make those decisions. Uh, you know, I would like to make a comment on Trish's, Trish's words about getting out of the fixedness problem and how to do something that's new because our challenges right now are staggering. We have to make different better. We have to turn our adversity into privileged opportunity. We have to find a new path forward and we have to do what's never been done before. Other than that, everything's fine. But when you think it's too hard, just think. We're going also through the social justice awakening, which I completely support. That started in Nashville. Go back to David Halberstam's The Children and see what he did in terms of finding the seed of the story for the people who left the city of Nashville and all the divinity schools there, including John Lewis, who went down to the Deep South and said, we're going to fix this right now. And the battle has been ongoing. So we'll never learn what we don't want to know. And you can't finish unless you get started. So I think we should listen to what Trish is saying and take this data and take Sean's comments and Mark Cleveland and Governor O'Malley, and let's get this game going here. Because I want to turn this song 
Mark Cleveland, at the very beginning of this program, Mark Cleveland, he talked about the business practices of the Grateful Dead. I was honored because I, re I responded to a cold call from David and Brian, who wrote that book, and they asked me to write the introduction, the foreword, if you will. And I had no idea who these guys were, and it turned out to be one of the great books ever written and one of the best friendships and relationships that I've ever had. And so if we're always looking for that new direction forward, let's put a, let's put a song to it, because I know that Governor Martin, he's a rocker. He's got his rock band going. He wants to open for the Grateful Dead. Not the best idea, because the crowd is waiting for the dead. So have your own show, but you learn the song, the combo song of Lost Sailor, Saint of Circumstance. And the words go something like this. I used to be a lost sailor, away too long at sea. Now I'm a tiger in a trance, a saint of circumstance. I sure don't know what I'm going for, but I'm going to go for it for sure. And there's no time to lose. And that's where we are right here now with Act and Hitch and all the wonderful panelists on this program. And I'm Bill from San Diego, and I have mobility issues. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Amen. We have some uh, we have some door prizes uh, for everybody who stayed late. We're gonna ask you to click on the chat and uh, go see if your name was selected during this process. You all you need to do is click that link and go see if you're gonna get some signed memorabilia from our our pump it up and go compete uh, guest celebrity Bill Walton. Thank you everybody for participating in this. Mark, and, can I say it just a can I say something, Mark? I couldn't dream of getting a shot clock. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm not very welcome in Tennessee after what happened with Memphis. Memphis is still in Tennessee, correct? After what happened in Memphis 37 years ago, 47 years ago, excuse me. But I do have some friends there, including Mark Cleveland and Jonathan Levine. I also got Casey Jones, who's from Cleveland, and Tennessee Jed, and Rick Barnes, and Jack Daniels, all close personal friends. And, and I know you got the Cumberland Gap that brings everybody right into Tennessee on the eastern side and the Great Smoky Mountains and the, and the beauty. And if we can learn from Trish that we will never learn what we don't want to know, and if we're afraid of that black-throated wind, we are just going to never have a chance. And we have to put everything that we have into this effort because it's not just transportation. It's not just hitch. In California, where we live, transportation is 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions. And we are just forcing ourselves into an untenable, unsustainable situation because not only are we facing COVID-19, we've got the economic collapse, which Aaron was brilliant at pointing out. Sean, excellent job yourself as well. But also we have the social justice awakening, which has to keep going. The inequality in our country is just destroying what fabric we have left. And then climate change and species extinction challenges. And so unless we get to work today, unless we put aside our lunch and our next meetings, get going, we have no chance. And I believe in Mark Cleveland, and that's why I'm here today. Yeah. That's too. great words. We have, we have a lot of dedicated professionals out there in the field working in communities across the country and around the globe, you know, you know, on this effort to reduce vehicle emissions and, and create more sustainable communities. And, uh, you know, I thank them all every day. It's wonderful to have them. We'll get there. I was having an interesting conversation with a Beethoven uh, group the other day. And, there, and the conversation focused at the end on Beethoven's decision when he was in his mid-20s to not kill himself because he had a terrible life. His personal life was just atrocious. And he was going to kill himself. He had gone deaf. His dad was just a brutal thug. And there was just, it was, there was no real reason for Beethoven to keep going. But he didn't do it. And he lived another 30 years. And just before he died, when he's 57, somebody asked him, why didn't you kill yourself when you were thinking about that? And he said, I knew, I learned, I realized, I accepted, I embraced it. Yes, I had challenges. But I had a responsibility to give everything within me out to the world and to never leave anything inside. And that's where we are right now. We've got an election coming up. We've got a day-to-day -day challenge right now. And I'm ready to fight. Put me in, coach. Let's go. It's a beautiful day to get going. 
And with that, we have a speaker gift for every single person present, including David Strauss. Um, big surprise. If you happen to have it handy, please feel free. I also noticed that uh, that Governor O'Malley might have something to say, and I didn't want to cut him off because we're about ready to wrap. No, I'm good to go, man. Thank you. Honored to, uh, honored to be a part of this. Thank you. Yep, and Let's I spread this message. I'll have to turn off my background. Everybody's got a box. What's in the box? And don't forget, everybody who's a winner in the uh, door prize will see a little something similar. What do you got there, David? This is awesome, actually. It's like, a, a, you know, this is an autographed Bill Walton ball. I am a diehard Portland Trailblazers fan. And so uh, am I. I, was, I. I know, <laughs> I know. But I have to show you, I do have on my office wall, this is my pride and joy possession. A print from the 1977 championship game uh, with you blocking a shot of Dr. J. Uh, Send it back. Yeah, don't bring that weak <laughs> stuff in here. Free public mass transportation. Let's go. Start the fast break. You know, I'd love for you to share a story of. Uh, I, I think you used to bike to game. Trish and Charlie, and you can take your, you can take the ball out of the bag. It's okay. The, so excited! Oh my gosh! Yay! There you go. <laughs> I oh, thank you. you so much. This is so, amazing. In life, we have to have tools, tools to execute the task at hand. Now, the tool in the game of basketball is the ball itself. And by itself, that ball does nothing. But when you make that ball an extension of your mind, anything is possible. Oh. Just, like the, just like what the NBA is going to do right now, to do what's never been done before. And they've, they're doing an excellent job so far. It's a day-to-day -day battle. You never know how the game is going to turn out, whether it's basketball, whether it's getting on the bus, whether it's getting on the train, whether it's opening up hits, whatever. But you got to go for it. You can't just sit there and wait for it to come to you. Yep. Now, Bill, before we have to end, I'd love for you – I know you're a huge cyclist. We have a lot of, uh, you know, people on the, on the call who are dedicated cyclists, working hard to promote biking in their communities. Um, you used to bike to games, I think, even maybe yes. you had your, your bike stolen uh, on the way. Yeah. The I love my bike. And, and I, I ride my bike all the time. I can't walk. I can't play sports. I can't run. But I can ride my bike. And I can ride my bike all day long. And I still ride to this very day. And it's so heartwarming because with the lockdown, with the shelter in place, with the stay at home, with the telecommuting and the, and, and the working from home, we are seeing here in California record numbers of cycling, new participants getting up, getting out. And where we used to be just a few of us outside, and one of the great things about our plan to move forward here is the, the insistence that our individual health takes a huge priority. And health doesn't just happen. For someone who spent half his adult life in the hospital because of orthopedic challenges, who's had 38 orthopedic operations, who's had my life derailed so many different times because my body has not been able to carry me to my dreams, I can still ride my bike. And I get out there to see everybody else. And all the bike shops are back ordered on all the parts. All the suppliers, they have nothing left. All the, the transportation companies for bicycles, they are just overwhelmed with work. And that just warms my heart. And now our challenge is to, in the, as the world gets going again and starts up and tries to find that new path forward, is how we are going to make this new world a better place. And that we don't just leave all the stuff we learned here. It's very much like the message of the Grateful Dead. When you come out, uh, there I am on the climb, dropping Chris Carmichael, dropping Sean or Eric back there. I, can't, I dropped the whole group. I'm just d dumping them there on the, on the Mount Hamilton climb. just. Just uh, east of San Jose in the Silicon Valley. What a day that was. I love my bike. Excellent. Uh, well, I, I am thrilled that you were able to join us today. Mark, thank you so much for, for bringing Bill on. It, yes. you know, it, it was uh, our first celebrity guest on, a, on an ACT webinar. Uh, I know we're a bit past the top of the hour, so I want to make sure that... Uh, uh, we got started late. It's okay. <laughs> You know, that we you know let all of our, our our attendees that are on still to you know let them know that uh, we appreciate 
uh, you joining us today. Hope you register for the international conference coming up in two weeks. And uh, with that, I think we will probably need to sign off. And uh, as we prepare for the ACT happy hour starting up in a, in a couple hours from now. So thank you all. Thank you. I'm happy today because of my friendship with Mark Cleveland and all my new teammates here, Tricia and Aaron, Sean, and all the folks here who have made my dreams come true. And uh, Martin, thank you. You guys are awesome. What a day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Bill. Thank you to all thank the panelists. You. Have a great day. Bye-bye.